I'm Joe Ankis. I'm coming to you live from sunny South Florida, um, down in Weston, which is quite a quite a ways from Tallahassee. Um, and I'm happy to chat with you today on this uh, attorney mental health first aid program. Um, what we're going to do is basically cover four fundamental points. I'm going to introduce you to mental health first aid, the actual training, um, what the role of a mental health first aider is, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the prevalence and impact of mental health uh, problems in the United States. And when we talk about that, I'm going to use some specific data germane to attorneys, which was provided by the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing in 2017. And then I'm going to segue into introducing you to what we call the ALGE protocol. Um, has anybody in the audience been certified in mental health first aid by any chance? Okay, nobody? Okay, that's great. So we have a protocol. It's an acronym, ALGE, A-L-G-E. -E, and before we're done today, you'll, you'll all know what ALGE is and what it stands for. And then I'm going to speak to you finally about two prevalent topics, especially relevant to the attorney population, which are anxiety and depression um, from a mental health first aid perspective. So we've got a lot to unpack. We'll, I promise we'll get it all done, and we'll certainly leave time at the end for questions. So let's jump right in. So regarding mental health first aid, essentially what it is, it is a program that's eight hours long that's designed for everybody. Um, even though my interest and my background is in the legal field, um, mental health first aid is equally as effective for any person in any profession. Um, and I want everybody to understand that it's designed for people that have no formal mental health training. Um, I am a lay person. I am a lawyer and, you know, a regular person. I um, am not in the mental health field. Uh, I don't diagnose, counsel, treat, prescribe. Um, I'm like all of you. Um, the only difference is, is that I'm eligible to teach the program, which I thoroughly enjoy teaching. Um, people come to mental health first aid with a lot of questions all of which are understandable and reasonable. Um, one of the most important things that I tell people when we do the session, the eight-hour training, is, is what our role is as a mental health first aider. And I make it very clear, and people find it reassuring. Our role is fairly direct. Um, we are there to provide support and give credible information and resources to somebody that may be experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, that's what our role is. And so people sometimes breathe a sigh of relief because they not, we're not asking anybody to diagnose, treat, cure, counsel, therapize, has nothing to do with mental health first aid. We stay within our lane and we leave that to the professionals. But what we are required to do is provide support and credible referrals if the person wants our input. Mental health first aid is completely voluntary. The only exceptions that you will see are if somebody is actively suicidal or there is harm to a third party. Um, the training itself generally takes place either in one eight hour block or we do it over two days, four hours a piece. Um, my personal preference is over two days because it allows the class to have a break and it also allows you to kind of take the night to digest some of the topics. Um, the material itself is straightforward, uh, but people really um, find that some topics can be very personally challenging. Um, they can be upsetting, um, but everybody almost universally agrees that at some point in their lives, they either personally or knew somebody close to them or a colleague or a classmate, wherever they may be, that could have benefited from this training. So that should give you kind of a, a general sense. The program was founded in Australia in 2001, brought to the United States in 2008. And I, I believe, I'm not sure of the exact number, but 
if not a million, close to a million people have been certified in, in the discipline. Um, which brings us to the next question is, is why is this important? Why, why are we all here? Well, we're all here because, unfortunately, uh, mental health is a topic which is finding its way into the news almost on a daily basis. Um, we find that mental health issues um, are at the forefront of law firms' management committee meetings. Uh, I know working with Florida Lawyers Assistance uh, that lawyers are actively seeking help. Um, and at the same time, we are battling the two demons of stigma and basically shame. Um, and mental health first aid does its part to really roll back the stigma and do, you know, the extent we can erase the shame for those that need help or know somebody that needs help. Um, I'm not particularly a statistics person, but let me just give you a few to underscore why we're here. So the statistics I'm going to give you come from the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing. Um, their mandate, which included the ABA and other prominent legal groups, was to create a movement to improve well-being in the legal profession. And I have the actual report. I encourage anybody, if they want to, to read it, I'm sure it's online, but it's basically 72 pages, single-spaced, about where we are, where we should go, and what we can do. Um, and so one of the initial things that we, we talk about are the challenges. So the challenges are this. Um, collectively, attorneys are problem drinkers 21 to 36% of the time. Approximately 28% of attorneys suffer or have suffered from depression or depression-related illness. 19% have suffered from anxiety. Between 23 and 25% suffer elevated stress and or addiction to work. Um, tragically, and one of the reasons why I am involved in this is because we lost eight people by their own hand in South Florida a number of years ago, all attorneys. Um, so unfortunately, we do have a disproportionately higher suicide rate among vis-a-vis -vis the general population. Um, and then we kind of spin the web a little more. There's obviously work-life conflict, balance conflicts, job dissatisfaction and attrition, inclusion, diversity, all these things roll into the litany of challenges we have. But at the same time, these challenges are an opportunity. Um, and what I love about mental health first aid is, is I really view it as a bridge um, to where we would like to be and where the national task force would like us to be, which is physically healthy, mentally thriving, focused on our clients, willing to seek help, um, are actively engaged with our colleagues at work, not afraid to have a tough discussion, um, and otherwise generally approaching the practice of law and the legal profession with a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. Um, so my role is really that bridge, which is to recognize the challenges and certainly not ignore them, but at the same time, use mental health first aid to improve the performance and the quality of all the teams that you're working with. So that being said, um, what you find is, is that mental health first aid in the law firm setting generally will occur in a variety of ways that you're all familiar with. It very well could be that you notice a colleague um, who just doesn't seem like themselves or somebody mentions to you over coffee that they're concerned about somebody on the fourth floor because they've noticed them after hours crying at their desk or somebody may uh, find that they're having difficulty at home with a partner or a child or a relative. Um, there, there's no limit to the amount of scenarios we could spin that would be applicable to mental health first aid. So what you're going to find is, and what I tell people when we take the class together is, 
even if you never use this in a work setting, mental health first aid can be used in your personal life just as effectively and just as easily. So for those that say, oh, everything is fine at work, not a problem, you can use it in every other aspect of your life. How does it work? So it works basically on the general principle that somebody is willing to engage with you um, on some level regarding difficulties they might be having. So we have no mandate. We, we can't force mental health first aid on anybody. Um, one of the things we teach people because there are certainly a number of people, understandably, that would prefer to keep things private, would prefer not to talk about them. And one of the things that we tell people in mental health first aid is, is we're not a police force. We're not there to violate anybody's confidentiality unless it's a very, very exceptional and, and exigent situation. But what we're there to do is listen and support and offer information. And when we do that, um, what we find is is that most people, if it's a non-threatening approach, are receptive. But if somebody is not receptive to mental health first aid, what we tell people to do, and I certainly share it with you, is, is say, listen, you might not want to talk right now. You might not want to ever talk about it, and that's always your choice. Um, but let me give you my cell phone number, and if you want to talk, I'm available. And if you promise to be available, then be available, Okay. Um, we, we, in mental health first aid, we, we don't like to offer support if we're not going to be in a position to give appropriate support. Um, how does it work? Okay, so the way it works is, is we basically use a protocol called algae, which I had alluded to in the beginning. And so let me take you through algae, because unpacking algae basically takes you know, a little bit of time and a little a few steps. Um, the A in algae is when we assess somebody for risk of suicide or harm. And that topic in and of itself is very scary. Um, it's nerve wracking. Um, and it's often one of the things that people come into the class most apprehensive about, which is, I, how do I handle this? How do I deal with this? And part of your training in the eight-hour class is to learn how to assess for a risk of suicide or harm. Now, I'm not going to take you through the suicide protocol. That would be inappropriate for the time we have today. But suffice it to say, we, we are not shy about, you know, making inquiry, um, a diligent inquiry to the person to see how they're feeling. Um, I have had to use mental health first aid over the, you know, over the years um, in a variety of contexts. Um, and when I had to do a suicide assessment one time, um, the person the next day said to me, quote, wow, you, you really went for it. And I said, well, I said, yeah, I needed to ask you some, some straightforward questions to make sure you were okay. And their response was, I really appreciated it. Um, so I just want you to know that if you do the training, um, you know, we will cover thoroughly uh, assessing for risk of suicidality and harm to third parties. Um, so that's the A. After we do an assessment, if it's necessary, because realistically, many, many times, suicidality is not even in the equation for us, okay? We put it as the A because it is a priority take care of and address. But really, as we go through the L, the G, the E, and the E, um, you're going to see that we spend more time as a mental health first aider over time. So L means listen non-judgmentally. And people always kind of chuckle because we all probably think, myself included, that we're wonderful listeners and we probably think that we are all non-judgmental and have no biases um, and no preconceived notions and, and, and all those things. And mental health first aid training really helps us come to grips with the fact that we all, including myself, can benefit from learning really how to listen. Um, and then we add the layer of 
non-judgmentalism. So, so let me let me just break it down a little more. Listening non-judgmentally means that when you are speaking to somebody about something they may be experiencing in their mental health, um, it's about not necessarily agreeing with them. It doesn't ask you to suspend your own opinions or beliefs. What it means is, is that you're going to suspend your own opinions or beliefs so that you can do your best to try to listen and meet the person where they are in their world, right? We generally, when we listen to people, and again, I'm always including myself in this, um, we tend to answer in our mind what they might say. We tend to finish sentences in their mind that they might say. And we really try to move away from that and allow a person to express themselves in an environment that lets them feel heard, acknowledged, validated, and understood. Um, and again, has nothing to do with necessarily agreeing with them. Um, what we find is when somebody is given the space um, and your attentiveness, many times just the mere act of listening results in improvement. Um, many times people will say, and they've shared in classes with me, you know, when somebody was just willing to let me vent or, or hear me out um, or really take 10 minutes to understand my viewpoint, that in and of itself was an incredibly stress relieving and validating experience. So we spend a fair amount of time working as a group using role plays and examples and scenarios on how we all can better listen non-judgmentally. And when we talk about listening non-judgmentally, one of the things that's important to remember is, is that we don't want to be distracted. Um, We've got, everybody's got one of these, and unfortunately, um, when this is going off or it's where we can see it, that is not a recommended strategy for listening non-judgmentally. Um, <laughs> who's a well-regarded lawyer in South Florida, Paul Singerman said this at a mental health presentation, and I, and I credit him for this. He says, if you're going to show up for somebody, show up. Um, we may be multitaskers, and that may be fine at your desk when you're juggling emails, et cetera, so forth. But when you are in your role as a mental health first aider, the cell phone needs to be off and flipped over um, because that person needs to know that you are listening to them in a safe, private environment. Okay. Um, the other thing that I tell people about mental health first aid, um, you can't learn when you're speaking. You really only learn when you're listening, when you're taking in the information and trying to process it. And so we teach people when they listen non-judgmentally to also try to paraphrase and repeat back what was being said to make sure that you're not making any assumptions as to what the person might mean or how they're feeling. Um, because again, we're wearing our own glasses and seeing the world through our own eyes, which is understandable, but we want to meet them where they are. Um, the other thing is confidentiality. Um, and I, I told you earlier, we've only got a couple exceptions to that. Um, but when you are in your role and you are listening and learning about somebody and they're trusting you, um, that is, I consider that to the same level of attorney client privilege, um, doctor patient privilege, you know, parishioner privilege. Hey, somebody is willing to talk to you about a personal situation, it must be given that confidentiality and dignity. Um, unfortunately, uh, you do hear stories where people share and then they feel violated because somebody spoke about it to somebody else, even with the best of intentions trying to help them. But we really stress confidentiality. And, and being in the legal profession, all of you are already pre-sensitized to this. Um, when we talk about giving reassurance and information, um, there's a couple things there. One is mental health first aid, and one of the things that I really like about it and respect about it is, is that it's our role to give hope. Um, the evidence shows, and mental health first aid is evidence-based, the evidence shows that with early intervention, proper professional, um, people can and do get better. 
Um, there's it, it, the evidence supports it. Um, I'm sure if people if you've known in your own life may have benefited from appropriate professional help, whether that would be uh, speaking to a therapist, a clinical social worker, a psychiatrist. Some people benefit from medication. Um, we're, mental health first aid in your role and my role, we don't take a position on advocating medicine, no medicine, therapy, no therapy. What we do is we give hope and we give credible information. And credible information in your materials, you will see at the end, I've given you uh, some resources. Um, I've given you national mental health resources, some Florida specific mental health resources, and then some online resources. Um, a couple things you want to know about the resources. So, for the most part, for any challenge you might encounter as a mental health first aider, if it's not on the list I've given you, there is most likely a credible source located on the internet. But remember, I keep saying credible because, as you know, the internet is the great unknown, and there, for each credible site, there are five sites which are not credible. Um, and we leave that to you to kind of winnow through and determine uh, what is credible, but I certainly give you a nice launching pad here. Um, the other thing is, is because we're in Florida, um, I can only speak for South Florida, but we have something called crisis intervention team officers, CIT officers. Does anybody know, while we're speaking, does anybody know if Tallahassee has crisis intervention officers? Do you know, does anybody know that? So, so what a crisis intervention officer is, is if you ever need to call 911, uh oh, am I still there? You're frozen. You're frozen. Can you wiggle your mouth? Can you see me? Oh, wait. All right. You're back. You're back. You're back. Great. You good? Yep. Does anybody need mental health first aid? Just kidding. Okay. Just kidding. Okay, look. So, so what happens is, is um, crisis intervention teams, they have been specifically trained in not basically mental health first aid type protocol. It's not necessarily mental health first aid. But, you know, if somebody, if there's a weapon involved, if there's somebody that is unconscious, um, is belligerent, is suicidal, threatening harm, that we, that, that's 911. Okay, that is, that's outside the scope of mental health first aid. But if and when you call 911, it is appropriate to say this is a mental wellness issue. Do you have a crisis intervention team available? Because the difference between a crisis intervention officer and a generally trained police officer could lead to a better result um, because they're trained. Okay, so I just want you to know that, but we always default to 911 for medical or police emergencies. Um, when we also give reassurance, we, we don't make false promises, um, we don't guarantee, um, but we give a genuine hope is, is we find that people really appreciate knowing that with proper help, it can and will get better. Um, people really appreciate that. And reassurance may be a phone call, it may be a cup of coffee, it may be you going over to somebody's office. Um, it, it, again, the, the scenarios, we could spend a month coming up with the scenarios, but reassurance can be given in a variety of contexts. What we do train people, however, is, is that again, a mental health first aider never puts their own safety in jeopardy. So when we are giving reassurance, again, we want to make sure that we are protecting ourselves uh, from any unexpected situations that could escalate um, and result in harm to us. Nobody is asking you to put yourself in harm's way as a mental health first aider. Um, in Florida, I did want to share a couple things with you. Um, Florida Lawyers Assistance. Um, 
They're wonderful people. I have actually certified all of them in mental health first aid. Um, it was a pleasure to work with them. Um, for those of you that know them, that's wonderful. For those of you that don't, uh, they are located a little closer to me. They're in Pompano Beach. Um, they have a full-time PhD psychologist on staff, Dr. Scott Weinstein, uh, and two certified addiction specialists who also are both attorneys, Judy Rushlow and Molly Paris, as well as a dedicated team of assistants. And their website has tremendous amounts of material on it. They are incredibly accessible. Um, and I have their phone number, so I don't need to give it to you, but it's under Florida Mental Health and Wellness Resources, and their website is fla-lap.org. So if you ever need to default to a Florida-specific website, I encourage that. Um, the other one that I will call to your attention about information is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Again, I recommend that everybody put this in your cell phone. Um, I don't even mind if you take three minutes right now to do it because there is no time like the present. You'll see it. It's on the first one on your national wellness. It's 1-800-273-TALK. They're available 24-7. Um, you know, I'll leave, you know, you guys even look at your cell phones. We'll put that in there now while I'm speaking. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, when you call them, it sounds ironic, but you may very well be put on hold. And I had a situation where somebody had come to me uh, and said, Joe, you're not going to believe this, but I, I reached out to them and they put me on hold. Isn't that ironic? And I said, you know, I said, that's unfortunate, but that just tells you how busy they are and how, you know, common people needing help is, and that's a good thing. And, and I kind of framed it in a way which was people need help. That's why you're on hold, not because they don't want to help. And that made that person feel better about it versus feeling stigmatized. So that's, again, one of your first lines, um, you know, if anybody you think may be suicidal aside from 911, is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, there are text lines. There are people with hearing impairments. I mean, they have all sorts of ways to access these resources. If English is not a primary language, they offer, I know for a fact, in Spanish, and I'm certain that there probably are other languages that are accommodated as well. Um, anybody working with the judiciary, we have a Judges Helping Judges helpline. Um, the material is there. The information is there. It may take a little patience to extract it, but it's there. Um, and so I encourage you to familiarize yourself with the resources. Um, when we move onwards to the, the E of encouraging appropriate professional help, um, a professional in mental health first aid terms is somebody that is licensed to provide psychological services. Um, that could be a psychiatrist, a licensed clinical social worker, a clinical psychologist. Um, professional health is somebody that is specifically trained. We as mental health first aiders are not professionally trained therapists. And I repeat that to reinforce that concept. Um, we don't mandate that anybody see a psychiatrist or a therapist, but what we do do is tell them that certainly it's a resource they should consider. Um, and we encourage it because the evidence shows that it can help many people feel better and live a more productive life. The other thing that is counterintuitive, and I love to share this with people, is most people's first entry point into the mental health treatment world is their primary care physician. So that's something you can take away with you. Two things. One is their primary care physician, or if they're fortunate enough to have an EAP, employee assistance program at work, those generally are the two confidential entry points. Um, and so I always tell people that help can be as close as your general practitioner. Um, 
people sometimes think, but they're just a family medicine doctor. But no, they're trained enough to assess whether a referral to a psychiatrist is necessary or whether a referral to a therapist is necessary. But especially for people that have a close working relationship with their primary care physician, um, that could be a very convenient and somewhat manageable schedule uh, to get an appointment with. One of the challenges we have, and Christine knows this because we had a psychiatrist on our special committee, um, is getting the help. Um, unfortunately, and it's very sad for me to say, but in the state of Florida, I was told you know, by the psychiatrist himself, he said, Joe, there are counties in Florida where there are not any psychiatrists. Um, this is 2019, and that's very, very upsetting uh, that, you know, that the help is not there. There are some movements now towards telepsychiatry, which is in increasing uh, availability, but we, we do have a shortage. And again, it's something you want to know as a mental health first aider uh, because you may want to help when you try to track down appropriate resources, recognize that it's not you if you don't find somebody. It's because we just simply don't have enough. Um, the final E is encouraging self-help and other support strategies. So after we've talked about encouraging appropriate professional help, then we're going to talk to them about self-help and other support. And what we mean by that is exactly what it sounds like. Self-help is things we can do for ourselves that don't require professional intervention. For example, yoga, meditation, a dietitian, uh, physical exercise, creative outlets, bicycling, art, music. Um, we encourage self-help. We encourage what I would call healthy self-help. Um, we don't encourage self-medicating. Um, we don't encourage behaviors that might not bring somebody to a better state, okay? So when we talk about self-help, it's the things that a person can do for themselves. Other support strategies are varied. Um, they could be anything that's helpful. And, and let me, you know, kind of dial in a little bit. Um, a very helpful support strategy for some people is if they're a member of a faith community. That can be a wonderful support strategy. Um, people in the faith community, many of them are able to provide pastoral counseling, and that may be an entry point uh, for somebody if they have a close relationship with one of their spiritual advisors in their faith community. Uh, that can be a helpful starting point. But other support strategies could be, for example, in the substance use category, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, all the anonymous programs may be a support strategy that can work for that person. Um, we just want to give the person that is receptive an array of options. And that array of options starts with information that's credible, appropriate professional help, credible and helpful self-help, and any other appropriate, helpful support strategies. So we take a very holistic global view where we use professionals and ourselves, if we're able, to, to encourage and enhance mental well-being and, and wellness. So that is the ALGE protocol. And again, I'll repeat it to you briefly. A, we assess for risk of suicide or harm. L, we listen non-judgmentally. G, we give reassurance and information. E, we encourage appropriate professional help. And the final E is we encourage self-help and other support strategies. So if we were to work together, by the time, I always tell the students, by the time the class is over, you don't want me to say, tell me about algae again. They don't want to know. They already know. They've done eight and a half hours of repeating algae. But it works. Um, I've had to, like I said, I've had to use it. Um, it's very comforting for me to have the protocol, just as it would be comforting for any mental health first aider to know that this has been used and, and works. Um, 
So that's the protocol. So the last part of my talk before we turn it over to questions, and I hope there are plenty of questions, is a little bit about depression and anxiety. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time on this. Um, the reason why we talk about depression and anxiety in this session is because depression and anxiety arguably are, are two of the most common and prevalent uh, mental illnesses that we might encounter um, as mental health first aiders. Um, interestingly enough, um, people sometimes think that they're opposite of each other. Um, if you're depressed, you can't be anxious, and if you're anxious, how could you be depressed? And interestingly, they exist together many times, and, and the way I explain it to people is, is that if you're depressed, you may become anxious because you don't know how long your depression is going to last. Conversely, if you're anxious, you may become depressed because you don't know how long you're going to feel anxious. So it's not uncommon for this to occur, we call it comorbidity, where it occurs together. But basically, when we talk about depression and anxiety, we need to be clear. All of us, if I said, raise your hand, have you ever had a bad day, I know your hands would fly up, okay? And if you asked me, my hand would fly up. If I ever said, did you have a bad week, less of your hands might fly up, but some hands would fly up. But we're not talking about when somebody goes, I'm depressed because your favorite team intercepted, you know, didn't intercept the ball. We're talking about depression, which lasts for at least two weeks. Um, so we, we put some parameters around our terminology so that people don't automatically default to think everything that happens in somebody's life will create a situation that is clinically depressed, okay? Um, anxiety is the same thing. Just because somebody may be momentarily stressed or on a big project, um, that doesn't mean that they're anxious. Um, we like to tell people there's stress and then there's distress. Stress in and of itself is actually a motivator. Distress is where we get concerned. Um, but we're going to carve out the normal day-to-day -day type stuff when we talk about anxiety and depression. So what we're looking for with depression is essentially uh, is somebody incredibly fatigued? Uh, are they sleeping too much? Um, are they complaining of crying spells? Are they withdrawing? Um, have they lost interest in things they love? That, that is an, uh, uh, an interesting little segue, which is if somebody was part of, of your lunch group or uh, you had coffee with them, you know, four times a week and all of a sudden you didn't see them, if you see those types of behavior patterns, those might make you inquire, um, are, are they doing okay, okay? Um, depression... Uh, you find really slows a person down. They, they literally will say they don't feel like they have the energy to get out of bed. It is not uncommon to hear that a depressed person will lay in bed for days. It can happen. Um, so watch for that. When I teach mental health first aid, what I explain to people is, is you want to be sensitive to people's kind of baselines. Um, I'm not talking about strangers. I'm talking about people that you know in your circle, uh, whether they be professional colleagues, friends, or family. You all know people close to you, how they are, roughly speaking, on a daily basis. Um, and when you start to see wide deviations from that normal, traditional interaction that you might have, that's when you might start to wonder, hey, maybe I should check in and see how they're doing. Okay? doesn't mean there's a problem. It just means you might want to check in. Um, when we talk about anxiety, um, we're really looking for whether or not this person's anxiety is impacting their daily life. And some of the things that you'll find with anxiety are that the person will feel on edge. They'll feel their heart beating in their chest. Um, they'll feel short of breath. Um, panic attacks can be linked to anxiety. Um, the interesting thing about both anxiety and depression is that, and we do an exercise in the training where we show that both anxiety and depression have psychological symptoms and physical symptoms, um, and that sometimes people will actually present 
at their primary care physician for a whole host of physical symptoms, the doctor will do an evaluation and the doctor, he or she, will tell the patient, you know, your blood pressure, you know, you look good. Um, and they may then go on and say to the person, um, what else is going on? Um, and that may open up the discussion uh, about psychological difficulties. Um, and we, we actually watch a video during the training that, that really shows how a primary care physician approaches this topic. And, and as an aside, a very brief aside, um, when I went to my general practitioner probably a couple of years ago, um, before I got there, I got like an online questionnaire, you know, kind of a mental health questionnaire. And I, when I saw her, I said, you know, I said, doctor, I said, let me tell you, I, said, Eli, I really am impressed. You guys are actually doing some screening now for mental health. And she says, yep. Yeah. She says, it's part of the protocol. And I said, tell me what's been going on with it. And she said, it's really been helpful um, in terms of getting people to talk more about it. And we're doing quite a bit of referrals out. Um, and so I thought that was wonderful. So something to keep in mind that you may present for physical, but it may segue into a behavioral type of discussion. Um, I'm not going to go through all the risk factors and, and, and all the things. We just simply don't have the time. In, during the training, we, we are very comprehensive with depression and anxiety. Um, basically, though, the main things we really want to watch out for if somebody is seriously depressed or seriously anxious, we want to watch out for suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We want to watch out for panic attacks. Um, and we cover all of those, you know, in depth in, in our training. Um, the other thing that I would say to you is that there is no one size that fits all when you take this training, if you take this training, you are going to find that because we are so diverse and we literally are so unique and none of us have lived the same life as anybody else, even if you are an identical twin, um, that you have to come to mental health first aid with kind of a flexibility, um, a willingness to challenge your own beliefs, a willingness to listen a willingness to respect somebody's right to see things differently. Um, when, I, when I teach mental health first aid, somebody will reach out to me, a client will reach out and say, Joe, we want to schedule you know, a training. And I'll say to them, I'll go, that, that's great. I said, um, do me a favor and don't mandate this. And they said, what do you mean? I said, you want people there that want to be there. I said, when you mandate somebody to be through and go through mental health first aid training, um, they, they may not be in the game um, because we're still fighting against that stigma and that prejudice and that shame associated with having frank, open discussions about this. Um, so what I always tell people is, is when I train them, uh, I want them to be there because this requires your full concentration and frankly, your full commitment. Um, it's important because you can save a life. It's important because you can improve a life. Um, and it's also important because it may save your own life or it may save uh, the life of somebody, you know, you're very close to or a complete stranger. Um, so, you know, I want to turn it over. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, I think, roughly. I, we started around 1130, right, Christine? Yes. So, yeah, so we have about 10 minutes. So anybody, please ask me any questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer them as best I can. All right. We did get one question uh, from Elizabeth, and the question is, is there a reason that the E for evaluation by a professional is before the E in encouraging self-help in the LG protocol? So that's, that's a, a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I guess the, the, the most... The most honest answer I can give you is I don't know what their hierarchical protocol was when they came up with the protocol. Um, so I don't really have a, I, maybe a satisfactory answer to that specific question. But let me give you an answer which may help. Um, algae, when we teach it, we teach it A-L-G-E-E. -E, and that are, those are the steps. But I explain to people that it's not always linear, which means 
that you might actually just listen first before you do anything. And you might find that the person is just having, you know, a, a, a bad couple days. Um, of, you know, they're doing okay. They're just feeling a little overwhelmed. And maybe you're going to encourage self-help because maybe you're going to suggest, why don't they take a 20-minute walk? And obviously, you're not going to encourage professional help because it wasn't warranted relative to what the, the topic of your discussion was. So to your point, Elizabeth, um, I don't know why they put that above. Um, because there are situations where we will not be linear with algae, and that, and, and that is taught in the class. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. It does. Thank you. All right, another question. If someone wants to have the training, is there a main – oh, oh, sorry – a minimum or maximum number of participants? Yeah, so – I, I will tell you, I will answer, I will give you the minimum, I will give you the maximum, and then I will tell you what my experience is with the ranges. The minimum under my certification is five, the maximum is 30, my ideal suggestion is about 10. Um, I've taught, I've never taught a group of five, it, frankly, it's, it's too, in my opinion, it's too small to really get a robust discussion. Um, when you teach 30, and I've taught 30 a bunch of times, um, you're, you're going to have more of a classroom feel, more of a lecture style, uh, more of a, a um, take you through the material, and there's going to be less opportunity for sharing personal stories that are appropriate to the class. Um, because 30 people, people feel uncomfortable, more uncomfortable, I should say. Um, when you have around 10 to 12, I like to say that's more where the magic happens, where people are around the conference table, um, and you'll find that people are, uh, generally speaking, more comfortable and willing to, to share. Um, we encourage sharing in mental health first aid. We discourage oversharing. Um, we discourage sharing stories about other people without their consent. Um, so... What I, what I always tell people is is that um, sharing is very helpful, um, provided we do it under you know some some workable, agreeable frameworks. But I would say to you that um, you know thirty people can absolutely be certified in it. Um, but if I had my if I had my pick in life, it's around you know ten to twelve um, because I just think people just feel more comfortable. Um, and the other thing is, is the physical setting. Um, I prefer, again, if we're around a conference table, it's a little more of a comforting setting than it is on a classroom style when I'm up in front and, and, you know, it's more professorial when I do that. Um, but again, some, some groups prefer the 30, um, and others, you know, it's it, just like, just like mental health first aid, it really depends on the group, but I'm very, I'm comfortable with, you know, it, it doesn't matter to me. I'm comfortable with either side. All right, one last question uh, before I read the CLE course number. If anyone wants to recommend mental health first training either to an individual attorney or to uh, a law firm or a group of attorneys, uh, how can they get that from you? Uh, e the easiest thing to do is, is – is call me. I mean, that's probably just the easiest. I just, you know, it, what, what, as you all know, as professionals, you know, in life, we've got to make a bunch of decisions. And, and one of the ones that, you know, one of the decisions we have to make is, is it better to make a phone call, send a text or send an email? It's probably just easier if you call me and my, my number is, you know, you can write it down as 954-862-1738. That's my office. And just, if I'm not around or if I can't take the call, you know, I will certainly call you back, just leave me your numbers. And, you know, I, I love teaching it. I, I believe in it. I know it works. Um, and, you know, regarding, the, you know, the parting thought that I'll leave you with is, you know, by, by participating in this today, you know, you, you're, you're ambassadors to, an, to a degree now. Um, you're going to find significant resistance um, still, sadly, in the legal community about talking about this stuff. Um, I deal with this resistance, if not, you know, weekly, daily. Um, there is still, we are, we, we've come such a long way and I'm grateful for it, but I'm telling you, we've got miles to go. So, um, next time, 
you know, somebody says, ah, it doesn't apply to me, or, oh, that's all, you know, hocus pocus, smoke and mirrors. Um, it's not. And, um, you know, and, and any skeptics, you can send them my way. And I'll, I'm happy to spend the time talking to skeptics. It's fun. Um, I always learn something. I know, I enjoyed it. I mean, I always enjoyed it. But, um, but I really thank you for all being there. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions, you know, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. Christina knows how to All right, we have one more question. Can you repeat phone number two? Yes. Uh, first, two more questions. Uh, one, can you repeat your phone number? My phone number is 954-862-1000. All right. Nine wonderful. five four. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then the next question is is actually a good question. So when you have a group in a law firm, are managers and attorneys in the same training? How how does that work? How would you how do you split that up? I actually I've actually had and and will be doing it. Um, I've had I've had all different combinations of people. I've had attorneys, staff. I personally think it's wonderful. Um, because some of the discussions are really enriching, and I've had both, um, you know, professionals and you know, um, you know, support their eyes really open wide because many times they don't necessarily know what the other person is going through. Um, I found that to be very helpful. Um, I think it's really important for people to hear each other's stories. Um, it's, it's really important. Mental health first aid is, is what I, you know, one of the first things I tell people, it's designed to be inclusive. Um, it's, it's designed to be for everybody. And that's not meant as a punchline to a joke. It's meant to be for everybody. Um, you know, so my attitude is the more diverse the group, the better it is. Um, I, I would, you know, again, if a client said we prefer to have only attorneys because we're going to discuss, you know, only attorney things, uh, okay, I respect it. I mean, we can do it. But if you ask me, you know, I found the mix to be enlightening. I encourage it. Wonderful. All right. Any more questions? Okay, save it. All right. For anyone watching this or present that needs CLE credit, the course number is 3621. That course number, again, is 3621. Thank you so much, Joe. That was really fascinating.